One of the staples of critical care is the close monitoring and intensive care for complex issues with our patients. Monitoring our patients' blood pressure is one of the most fundamental things that we do in the ICU, and it impacts a lot of what we do. As a result, having the most accurate and up-to-date measurement of our patients' blood pressure can be vital to timely, appropriate, and accurate care. And thus, I introduce the arterial line. All right, this is Eddie Watson, and I welcome you back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage, where my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care topics easy to understand. I hope that I'm able to do just that for you guys, and if I am, I invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, hit that bell notification and select all notifications, that way you never miss out when I release a new lesson. To test your knowledge at the end of this lesson, head over to icuadvantage.com or follow the link that's down in the lesson description. You can check your learning while also being entered into weekly gift card drawing. Also, don't forget that the notes for this lesson, as well as all the others, are available to the YouTube and Patreon members, along with some other great benefits as well. You can find links to both of those down in the lesson description. And so let's go ahead and get started here. The arterial line can have a lot of benefit for our patients in the ICU. That said, they do come with risk, which I will discuss more in a bit here, but we do need to ensure that the benefits of this line do outweigh those potential risks. I will attempt to explain various aspects of the arterial line and their use in critical care over the course of several lessons here. In this lesson, we're going to start off with the basics about them. And so let's go ahead and start off talking about what is an arterial line and why is it that we use them. So at its core, an arterial line or an A-line is an invasive way of measuring our patient's blood pressure. We insert an arterial catheter, which is similar to an IV catheter into one of our patient's arteries. We can then measure the pressure directly inside of the artery at any given time. Now, there are a few benefits to doing this, and there are reasons why we insert them. And the first one is going to be real-time reading. So the A-line is always giving us a reading, so at any moment in time, we can get not only the values for our patient's systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, and mean pressure, but also a visual tracing of the pressure waveform. Now this tracing can actually tell us a lot of information, and I am going to be covering this in much more detail in the next lesson in this series here. One big advantage to having this real-time blood pressure is when it comes to titrating medications, particularly our vasoactive medications. You'll be able to adjust the medication at any moment in time as you're going to know what your patient's blood pressure is at that moment. You're also going to be able to see the effects in real time of their blood pressure changing either up or down. So this allows us to monitor trends in real time for our patients. Here, think you are seeing your pressure beginning to fall and you can intervene before instead of waiting for an alarm to go off and hitting that limit. And this here is probably the most common benefit we get from an A-line. Now, another big benefit comes from easily being able to access blood for lab draws. Now, more specifically, when our patients are needing to have multiple frequent ABGs drawn, an A-line is going to be a lifesaver and really prevent repeated sticks for the patient. These frequent sticks are not only not great for the patient, but requires a lot of time Time to do for each one. So having an A-line really makes this incredibly easy. Now another benefit of the arterial line is going to be for patient comfort. Now as I just mentioned, for patients that are needing the frequent ABGs, getting poked for these is not a comfortable thing. So being able to easily draw from a line that makes this much more tolerable for the patient. Also, patients who are requiring titration of medication based on their blood pressure are going to need to have their cuffs going off frequently if that's all that we have. So here we're probably looking at at least every 15 minutes, if not more often. And as you can guess, this is also not very comfortable for the patient. And then finally, the last big benefit that I want to talk about is really going to be in our accuracy. And this is probably the biggest benefit of the arterial line is its accuracy. There are a few things to unpack here, so let's kind of talk about this one separately. So an arterial catheter, as we talked about, rests in the artery and is giving us a direct measurement of the pressure directly inside of the vessel where it sits. Because of this fact, if everything is working with the A-line, it's going to give us a much better measurement of the patient's blood pressure especially compared to the non-invasive blood pressure cuff. And so why is this? The question of whether to believe the A-line or the non-invasive cuff comes up time and time again. In fact, I can't count how many times this discussion has been had 
And yes, sometimes it is a valid discussion, but in almost all situations, I repeat, if the A-line is functioning properly, which I'll talk about here in the next lesson, we want to use that value. In fact, if everything is working, there's really no need to repeatedly cycle the non-invasive blood pressure cuff. Still leave it on and attach just in case of an emergency and you do need to get one if something were to happen with your A-line. Also, on a side note, this is kind of a pet peeve of mine. Uh, especially when the non-invasive blood pressure cuff is on the same arm as the arterial line. And then every hour it cycles and flattens the A-line momentarily, causing the red alarm to ring out. So please don't be that person. Trust in your functional A-line. All right, so back to why it is that we trust it more. So besides the obvious of the direct reading inside of the vessel, it also helps to understand how a non-invasive blood pressure cuff gets its reading. And so to do that, I'm going to draw out a graph here looking at at pressure versus time. As you've seen and heard, the non-invasive blood pressure inflates past the patient's systolic blood pressure. This is part of the discomfort for the patient here. It then releases a little pressure step by step until it gets past the diastolic pressure. And what happens is this drop in pressure creates turbulent flow, which oscillates against the arterial wall. And the non-invasive blood pressure cuff records these oscillations in pressure. Now, unlike when we auscultate a manual blood pressure, the non-invasive isn't auscultating anything. It's just measuring those pressure oscillations. And these oscillations, they start small and they grow to a maximum and then drop back off. And this all takes place as it's stepping its way down in pressure. Pressure. Now the maximum amplitude or the size that we see here is going to be our patient's mean arterial pressure or their MAP. And this is actually generally relatively accurate. Now, as the amplitude or size of these oscillations drop back down, when it reaches 80% of what the maximum is, this is going to be our patient's diastolic pressure. Now, this is less accurate than the MAP, but still relatively accurate. For the systolic, though, this is where we run into accuracy issues. So we don't have a good way to actually determine this. There are two schools of thought for different manufacturers. First, they can calculate the systolic blood pressure from the MAP and the diastolic blood pressure. As you can imagine, not the greatest for a measure of true systolic blood pressure. Second, we know that systolic blood pressure occurs when the size of the oscillations are somewhere between 25 and 50 percent before we reach that maximum, and thus they can guess based on this knowledge. Again, not a great solution and it's not going to give us a true systolic blood pressure. There are also some situations in which a non-invasive blood pressure is going to be even less accurate. So in low and high cardiac output states, as well as low or high SVR states, the non-invasive pressure is not going to be accurate. In addition, there are times, although not common depending on where you work, where we will not be able to have a non-invasive blood pressure in place. So here, think burns, trauma, etc. Sometimes we can use the legs, but again, we're losing accuracy this way. As a result of all of this, our patient's blood pressure values from a non-invasive blood pressure, especially the systolic blood pressure, are not necessarily the true values. They may be close, or even right on sometimes. Remember, we have that saying that a broken watch is right twice a day? But this is why, with a properly working A-line measuring the direct pressure in the vessel, it will be more accurate than a non-invasive blood pressure cuff. All right, so we talked about our patient's mean arterial pressure or their MAP, so I wanted to discuss this just a little bit more. As you know, the mean pressure is quite an important number to us. It essentially tells us what the average pressure is across the entire cardiac cycle through systole and diastole. Our monitors will show us this value, but it can be calculated. We know systole is half as long as diastole and takes one third of the cardiac cycle, leaving diastole with the remaining two thirds. So we can either take one third of our systole Systolic blood pressure plus two thirds of our diastolic blood pressure to get our MAP. Or another way to do this is you could say your systolic blood pressure plus two times your diastolic blood pressure divided all of that by three will also give us our MAP. Now, you're not going to need to really calculate out this MAP value, but it does help to understand kind of how we get this. The MAP, though, is our true indicator of tissue perfusion, which is ultimately the end goal. In the ICU, we often are really just concerned with our patient's MAP. Now, this is 
isn't always true, as there are situations in which we try to maintain systolic blood pressure within a certain range. There are some things to keep in mind which play an important role in our focus on MAP, though. The first is going to be vessel compliance. Now, compliance we can think of as elasticity. The less compliant, the stiffer the vessel. In less compliant vessels, we see higher systolic blood pressures and lower diastolic blood pressures. More compliant vessels are better able to maintain a narrower pulse pressure, which is the difference between that systolic and diastolic pressure. Now, regardless of a patient's compliance and the differing systolic and diastolic pressures, the MAP will remain relatively the same, hence our reason to want to titrate medications based on this value here. Now, another thing is going to be our A-line calibration. So in the next lesson, I am going to talk more about this, but if we have inaccuracies in our A-line, such as over-damping or under-damping, we end up with falsely high or low systolic or diastolic blood pressure readings. But again, our map is going to remain relatively the same. Again, another reason that we want to focus on this value. And then finally, we have something that we call distal pulse amplification. Now, this is also something that I'm going to talk about more in depth in the next lesson, but what this means means is that the further out from the heart, the higher the systolic blood pressure will be. Now this may seem a little counterintuitive, but as you know, the further out we go, we end up with smaller and smaller vessels. Due to the reflection of the pressure wave as the blood is being ejected off of these smaller vessels, that this can bounce back and travel back the other way through our circulatory system, and this can lead to an elevation in the systolic blood pressure. Now we do see some drops in mean arterial pressure as we travel further out in the arterial system, but the MAP is going to be much more stable than these changes that we see in the systolic blood pressure. Alright, so as with almost anything we do in the ICU, there are potential complications to arterial lines and this includes some potentially lethal ones. In fact, complications are reported to occur around 10 to 15 percent of the time. Of these, though, those that were clinically significant are believed to be less than 5 percent, making it a generally safe procedure. Now, one potential complication is going to be thrombosis. So, this is a clot forming at the catheter or insertion site, and this is actually the most common complication. It's usually not serious and rarely results in significant ischemia, so less than 1 percent of the time. This could lead, though, to surgery and possibly limb amputation. Now, the duration of the catheter insertion, its length and size, and hypercoagulable states all increase risk. The continuous flush system that we have in our tubing helps to mitigate this risk, though. Now, another potential complication is going to be embolization. So, this is the result of either air being introduced into the system or from the dislodgement of a thrombus at the catheter site. Peripheral cannulation is at greater risk, although thrombus dislodgement is greater risk for femoral lines. Now with air, as we know, it wants to travel up, so it can actually travel up the circulation and enter our patient's cerebral circulation, which obviously would not be a good thing. Another potential complication is going to be infection. So as with any invasive line, risk for infection is present. Contamination can come from skin flora, as well as potential ports of entry from stopcocks and other connections on the lines. Bacteremia can be seen, but this is actually a debated topic as to how common this occurs. Another potential complication is going to be bleeding, and this is potentially the most life-threatening. This can be minor bleeding from the insertion site, but what we're most concerned for is either a connection dislodgement or a stopcock being improperly positioned or moved. So either of these can lead to massive and quick exsanguination of your patient. So like I said, this is potentially a life-threatening issue to be aware of. Now another potential complication is going to be retroperitoneal bleeding. So the femoral site is often used in emergency and can actually lead sometimes to the transection of the femoral artery. So this can lead to retroperitoneal bleeds and hematoma. A large amount of blood can be lost this way and can significantly impact our patient's hemodynamics. And again, this can also be potentially life-threatening. Now, another potential complication is going to be hematoma. So here, transection of arteries or puncture of smaller superficial arteries may actually lead to bleeding and hematoma formation. So this is more common with the peripheral cannulation. And then the last complication I want to mention about is going to be vasospasm. Sometimes after cannulation, the vessel can become vasospastic. This is more a problem with insertion though, and oftentimes is going to lead to failed cannulation attempts. 
All right, and then finally for this lesson, I want to talk about the monitor when it comes to our A-lines. So the monitor is what's going to give us all of our values. So we're going to get our systolic blood pressure, we're going to get our diastolic blood pressure, our mean pressure, as well as our patient's heart rate. Now, we can also have the A-line attached to more complex monitors, such as the flow track, which can give us even more data, but I will save that for a future lesson. In addition to our values, as I mentioned, we're also going to be shown our arterial pressure tracing. Now, in the next Next lesson, I am going to do a deep dive specifically into this topic. The big thing with the monitor is going to be our alarms. Every monitor, in addition to the above information that I just talked about, has some very helpful alarms to help us keep an eye on our patient's blood pressure when we're not looking at the monitor. So it is absolutely vital that you review these alarms at the beginning of your shift and ensure they are on and appropriately set. In order to prevent alarm fatigue, which is shown to decrease outcomes for patients, make sure the limits for your alarms, even the yellow alarms, make sense for your patient. Having an A-line in place and alarms on can often give us warning of cardiac arrest or impending cardiovascular collapse as well. In addition, if something happens with your connections and your patient starts bleeding out, the alarm is going to ring out very early and will help you minimize the blood loss. And lastly, don't ignore these alarms. If you hear them, respond to them immediately. If they're alarming too much, then make the appropriate adjustments to your parameters. All right, so that concludes this lesson here, talking about the basics of the arterial line and giving you guys a good understanding of the basic concept of what these lines are. I really hope that you guys enjoyed this lesson. If you did, please go down below and leave this video a like. It's really appreciated and really helps in terms of promoting this video amongst YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love to read your comments and respond to each and every one of you guys. A special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you guys are willing to show me in this channel is truly appreciated. For the rest of you guys, if you'd be interested in joining and getting some of the additional benefits that you get for doing just that, you can join the YouTube membership down below or head on over to the Patreon page and check out some of those additional perks. You can also support this channel by following some of the links down in the lesson description, as well as checking out some of the awesome t-shirt designs that I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson in this series. Otherwise, check out a couple really awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, Thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.